And he asked them, but who do you say I am? Brothers and sisters, friends and family, I ask you this morning one of the most important questions you will ever ask. Who do you say God is? History is wrought with people who will tell you who they think God is. And this has changed over time. If you were to ask the Greeks, it would say something about uh, God's perfect essence, God's ousia. If you ask the reformers, they talk about God as omnipotent, as omniscient, as omnipresent. So when I consider this question, I wonder, who does God say God is? That could be a good place to start. And as God's revelation to the world, the Bible, is a good starting point. And when you go to the Bible, you will likely find that the Hebrew people don't try to get at the essence of God. They understand this as being beyond figuring out. Instead of talking about what God is, the Hebrews talked about what God did. So if you ask an ancient Israelite, who is God? They'd probably say something like, our God is the God who delivered us from Egypt. Our God is the one who brought us to our promised land. Our God is the one who defended us against our enemies, who guided us, who has made us a chosen people. Our God did this. These ancient forefathers would have told us that the most we can know from God is learned from God's actions. Bruce Manning tells the story of a recent believer in Christ that I like. Um, and this recent believer, he was approached by a skeptical friend. And the friend says, so, I hear you have been converted to Christ. Yes. Then you must know a great deal about him. Tell me, what country was Christ born in? I don't know, said the man. Well, what was his age when he died? I don't know. When was his birthday? I'm not really cer certain. How many sermons did this Jesus preach? I don't know. And the skeptic, he stands back and he says, well, you certainly know very little for someone who claims to be converted to Christ. To which the new believer responds, you're right. I do not know very much about this Jesus, but this much I do know. Three years ago, I was a drunk. I was in debt. My family was falling to pieces. They dreaded the sight of me. But now I have given up drink. Now we are out of debt. Now ours is a happy home. Now my children eagerly await my coming home each evening. All this Christ has done for me. This much I know of Christ. So who is God? Well, I challenge you to look at what God has done. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, said David, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for? The Bible is the written testimony of God's moving in humanity. It is a memory of the things that God has done. This is how we know who God is. This is how we can get to the character of the divine. God creates. God sustains. God liberates. God heals pains. God loves. God guides. God forgives. God provides. God redeems, God reveals, God comforts, God heals, God judges, God protects. In every trial, God directs, God rescues, sanctifies, God reconciles, and never lies. God rules, God gives light, God gives peace, God brings life. It's as it says in Colossians, God is before all things, and in him all things are held together. Great is our Lord and mighty is his power, the psalmist declares. God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. God brings good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. God sets the oppressed free. It's what God, God does because it's who God is. A warning, friends. 
that even, of the, even the best of us have a habit for putting up barriers to God's kingdom that God doesn't construct. Peggy Campolo likes to tell the story, which I love to share with you. It's an apocryphal but telling story. And in this story, Peter is the keeper of the gates of heaven, and Paul is the census taker. And Peter and Paul, they're troubled because every time they try to compare Paul's census records with Peter's tally, they find that there are more people in heaven than Peter is letting in. Neither of them can figure out this discrepancy. What's going on, they say to each other. Well, one day Paul comes running to the gates. He's yelling, Peter, Peter, I figured it out. I figured it out. It's not us. It's Jesus. Jesus keeps sneaking people over the wall. I saw the ladder. He's doing it. This, of course, is the good news of the gospel. Jesus will most certainly allow people into the kingdom of heaven that we would keep out. As Isabel Wilkerson cogently attests in her book, Cast, we have an innate propensity for creating systems of exclusion and systems of caste, a system so deeply embedded that it is often invisible to those who benefit from it, and yet all-encompassing to those who suffer from it. No, where we say to someone, no way, God says, Yahweh, I am who I am because I am. Very often I have someone come up to me and they say, Pastor, I like hearing about this First Baptist Church of Philadelphia. I admire the work that your community is doing. I applaud the work in addressing social justice. I'm encouraged by your vision for a more loving city. But I just can't believe in God. And I ask, well, do tell, friend, why? And they do. They tell me why. They say things like, well, God is a narcissist. God is controlling. God causes bad things to happen to good people and makes the powerful flourish. God seems violent. God seems mean. God seems spiteful. And God only wants to be worshipped. And I let them go on with their rant, and they keep going. And I always have this to respond. I say, well, I have to say, friend, I don't believe in that God either. The God that you described is not worthy of worship to me. Now let me tell you about the God that I do believe in. Friends, I'm not certain about a lot, but I believe in the God who loves you so much that he would do anything, even give his only son for you. As Paul says, for I am convinced that neither height nor, or I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you believe the testimony of God, and if you believe God is who God says God is, then you have to consider, who does God say you are? Because what God says about you is vitally important. Some weeks ago, I think in June, I told you about um, Charles Cooley's Looking Glass Self Principle. Does anyone remember this? Well, good, you'll get a, a repeat. Tony Campolo always points to this as one of the seminal sociological thoughts of the 20th century. And the great sociologist Charles Cooley, he puts out this theory that a person's self-concept, how you think of yourself, is to a large degree determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks of you. Got that? So I think I used Kathy as my example last time. Uh, if Kathy is the most important person in the world to me, and she's close, and she believed me to be this really handsome guy, right, then I'm going to start seeing myself as a really good-looking dude. And if you all were the most important people in my life, the most, in people in, in, most important people in my world, and you were the only persons I was ever with, I live with you day in and day out, and your feedback is all I'm hearing, and you all define me as a great guy. You're always saying, James, you're awesome. James, you're great. James, I love you. 
then how long do you think it would take before I start seeing myself as a really great guy? So I ask again, who is the most important person in your life? Is it Jesus? Because if it is Jesus, then you will care above all about what Jesus thinks about you. And if you have made the decision that Jesus is the most important person in your life, then I have got some great, fabulous news for you. You're going to have a very positive self-image phrase. Because if Jesus is the most important person in your life, you will begin to define yourself as you think Jesus thinks of you. And here's the good news. I'm not making this up. This is what the testimony of God says. Jesus thinks you're terrific. He really does. The Lord your God is with you. God takes great delight in you, we read in Zephaniah. I may not like you. I'm a pretty liking guy, but I may not like you, but God loves you. Sometimes people come into my office and they say things like, Pastor, I've got problems, I've got problems. And I'm a professional, I try to be. I sit down and I say, tell me your problems. And they say, oh, I'm horrible. Oh, I do all these things. Oh, I'm deranged. I'm messed up. I'm a pervert. And very calmly I say, well, tell me these things that make you believe this. Ten minutes later, I'm thinking to myself, you are deranged. You are messed up. You are a pervert. But then I'm reminded that God doesn't think those things. God thinks you are awesome. God really does. I like to say that I think of God like a grandma. God's got a wallet with your picture in it, and whenever he's talking with the archangels, he, he's weaving it around to you. He says, look at this picture of Jessica. She's doing great. Oh, have you seen what Zaza's been doing this day? He's doing great. Ask yourself, who does God say you are? Because if you believe the testimony of God, you will believe that you are beautiful. You will believe that you have purpose. You will believe that you were designed with meaning. You will believe that you are just the kind of person that God delights in. God says you're awesome, just as you are. We like to tell people they're not awesome, that they have things to work on, but God can see beyond that. We don't see as God sees. And God says that you're great. God says that if you were the only person to have ever lived and he had to die on a cross just to save you, God would do it all over again and again and again. Now, who do you say God is? Do you, as Peter did, declare Jesus as Messiah? Jesus as Lord. The first creed of the Christian church was this. Curios, usos, Christos. Repeat after me. Curios, usos, Christos, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord, is how we translate it. This was not a statement made with, made tritely. It was one made with serious consequence. In the Roman world, it was commonplace and expected that the public greeting to any good citizen would be, Caesar is Lord. You were allowed to worship other gods, but you had to maintain that Caesar is Lord. Well, the Christians didn't maintain this. And when these believers professed Jesus is Lord, they were making a treasonous political and religious statement that often warranted death. When we cry, Jesus is Lord, I wonder what would happen if we meant it to the degree that these first century believers did. What if when we declare Jesus is Lord, we meant that Jesus was Lord of more than just some aspects of our life, that Jesus was more than just our Sunday morning, that Jesus was more than just Lord of the church? What if when we boast Jesus is Lord, we meant that Jesus is Lord of my family, Jesus is Lord of my work, Jesus is Lord of my finances, Lord of my relationships, Lord of my attitude, Lord of my habits. What if Jesus really was Lord of our lives? Do me a favor, look around, look at one another. Very good. I am proud, truly, of the diversity that we have cultivated in this church. Long before I came here, you've been intentional about doing this. And this is good 
because it's been said that the church is the most segregated place in America. And I have to say, anecdotally, I observe that. Churches are very homogenous on Sunday mornings. They tend to look very much alike. And we know that this shouldn't be the case. We come to worship praising a God of humility and lowliness, but bestow seats of honor to the wealthy, the powerful, and the prestigious. We worship he who had little or none but honor, robber barons as benefactors, sponsors, and philanthropists. We worship the Prince of Peace, but laud military might like in no other age. We worship a God who gives all to all, and we fill our parking lots with BMWs. Oh, we build a wall. The BMW one hurts, by the way. Tony Campolo did a, a, a sermon called Jesus When You Drive a BMW. I drove an Audi for a long time, and that one really stuck. And yet we all sense the truthfulness in this statement. Yes, we build walls. I was in the northeast corridor of Nigeria in a village called Kautungo. Um, the Mai, the king of the village, he held a very special dinner for, for us. And every step was taken to ensure that we had the most amazing feast. And it was amazing. We had musicians and dancers and heaps and heaps and heaps of food. Earlier that day, I woke up and in my, uh, my host house, there were all these chickens. And then by the afternoon, there were like two chickens left. I was like, where'd the chickens go? And they're like, you'll find out. So we had this huge feast. And it was only when I was finishing my first plate that I began to take notice of the hundreds of starving men, women, and children who sat patiently behind us as we were eating, waiting for the opportunity for us to pass back our scraps on a plate. This was uncomfortable for us. In the West, this isn't something we particularly see. It felt weird. And our host sensed something of this. He, he, he shooed those closest to us away, and he says, don't let them bother you. Enjoy your meal. As if we could. And I wonder, I consider this, how often do we do this? How often do we build walls between us and the suffering of the world? How often do we build walls between us and the 35,000 children who die every day from starvation or diseases related to malnourishment? Don't we all want to go on enjoying our meals and pretending that the starving aren't there? Don't we all try to build a wall? Well, what if we dared to set behind all else, instead striving to make Jesus Lord, declaring as Paul did, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? What if we live like we believe God is who God says God is? What if we believed in the testimony of God? I wonder what the world would look like. A few weeks ago, you gave me the grace of going to Puerto Rico to speak at symposiums, and on Sunday I did this church, I got to see Jorge and Francis, yay. Um, and after my Sunday sermon, a woman came up to me, and she had been uh, following around the whole weekend, uh, and she was in tears. I said, what's wrong? And we start talking, and I learned that this woman was a lawyer, and she had just taken a role as uh, a very prestigious position at uh, an organization that deals with civil liberties. And she was concerned about this new role. I'm like, this is great. We're going to do great things. He says, no. I'm concerned because I'm not in the church. I'm concerned because I'm dealing with systems of state and not systems of the kingdom. She thought of herself as just working in a damaged system. And I was excited to tell her that, no, miss, I think you're on the right path. See, as Christians, sometimes we transcend the systems that we live in, right? You live in Nazi Germany, it's okay to transcend the laws. But we also immerse ourselves in systems, such as to change it. There are those who say we Christians shouldn't involve ourselves in political systems, uh, and we would do well to remember Edmund Burke's words. All that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is for enough good men and women to do nothing. So for that, I believe that we should work both outside of and in the system. I have to 
go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. The story of the Good Samaritan describes a man who found an opposing, uh, uh, a man of an opposing ethnic group beaten and robbed on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And we all know how the story goes. We know that the Good Samaritan cares for him and heals him and pays his expenses. And it's a good story. And the Samaritan did the right thing. But imagine if every two or three days there was another man on the side of the road, beaten and mugged. What then? At some point, being a good Samaritan isn't enough. At some point, if such crimes abound, we have to figure out how to put a better lighting system on the road. We have to have the road patrolled by police or patrolmen. We have to put an end to people being mugged, and if we find that the problems continues and those at City Hall aren't willing to do anything, well, we need to elect new people in City Hall. We need to have protests. We have, need to have sit-ins. We need to find public officials who will address the problems. Imagine what it would look like if we had doctors, nurses, lawyers, accountants, CEOs, producers, psychologists, clinicians, healthcare professionals, scientists, city workers, transportation professionals, musicians, laborers, the gifted, skilled, and impassioned of all sorts, working to make this place on earth here and now look more like heaven. Imagine the things we could do. In your activity sheet, I ask you, um, who is Jesus Christ to you? You don't have to open it, but consider it. It all starts with your answer to that question, who do you say I am? Because if you say that Jesus Christ is Lord, then your world will be radically different. We read, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The ways of the world are not necessarily the ways of God. The letter of James, we've been walking through this as part of our lectionary cycle, it shows us some of the practical implications of what it looks like when we make Jesus Lord of our life. And in particular today, we read about the tongue. Yes, the tongue, a, a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. The tongue is a fire, we read. James puts it that essentially the state of our heart is intimately connected to what comes out of our mouths. So my question this week is, friends, is what emanates from your mouth life-giving? Or is it life-diminishing? This is language that theologian Théodore de Chardin uses, and I find it helpful. Do your words partner with the expansion of God's kingdom, or do they hinder it? The tongue is fire, sharp and wild. A word can wound or heal the child. Guard it well, though hard to do, for peace begins with words from you. As you seek to make Jesus Lord of your life, the trick will be this. Live like God is who God says God is. Live like the testimony of God is true. You are great. You are awesome. You are a delight. You are loved and you are worth dying for. To the question, who do you say I am? May the answer be nothing short of, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the maker of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, we sense your majesty, we sense your wonder, we sense your might, we sense your grace. Let us sense more of you still. Let us come to know more of you still. And in the act of knowing, may our relationship grow. May we get closer to be able to say, Jesus Christ is Lord, and live it out fruitfully. Lord, we understand this is a big ask. We understand that we have a lot to work on. We say, as so many others do, I'm deranged, I messed up. But you say, you're just awesome. 
Help us to internalize that. And help us to continue to shape ourselves, to be more like the person you've called us to be. Kyrios Yusos Christos. Jesus Christ is Lord. May you hear it, O oh God. And may it be so. In your name we do pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please stand with me and sing.